Hey guys, welcome to the Kane Audio vlog. It's Friday, so it's time for another Ask Me Anything. Usual rules apply. Comment any question you want below this video and I'll get to you in next week's video. Uh, I'm gonna ruin the secret of TV here. I'm actually filming this on Thursday, it's not Friday. Uh, I've gotta be somewhere else tomorrow, so I'm filming it today, so. If you've just commented on last week's video within the last 24 hours then please copy and paste it into below this video because I wouldn't have seen it in the next 24 hours but the last 24 hours for you. Um, so before I get started is there any house admin? Uh, I have been flat out busy this week and I can't even think what I've done so I guess there's nothing to update. Uh, potentially the Sonic Academy Mixdown series that I've done could be out by the time this video comes out. So yeah I haven't had confirmation of that but I should be getting it today but I'm filming the video early so Go to sonicacademy.com and have a look for yourself. Uh, hopefully it is out. Um, it was a bit of a nightmare of a mix down because the baseline frequencies were just, well, they just didn't sit right with me. They were a bit muddy and, and I wanted this specific tone in the baseline and I struggled to get clarity, but actually there were a couple of things I did in this video because it's a track that's already been released and you guys will know the track. Um, and I redid the mix down from scratch. So I exported it from Bitwig as stems and zeroed off all the channels and really did a mix down from scratch for the video. Uh, and fortunately or unfortunately, I ended up doing a better mix down than the one that actually got released, uh, which is a bit well, embarrassing for me, but it's probably not a big deal for anyone else. Uh, so, I think that is it. Uh, yeah, let's just get on with last week's questions. Starting at the top, Sunset86. Hey Dom, Tesla, high five. Uh, thank you for answering my question with regards to Sam Sparrow snare crack sound. Oh yeah, I did get a, a copyright claim for that. Uh, I obviously played it too loud, unfortunately. Never mind. Uh, I guessed it may have been gated reverb, but the actual sound itself, I found that the Arturia drum boot, drum brute uh, impact has a white noise filter snare that sounds exactly like what I'm after. Yeah, that sounds like it probably do the job. Uh, so might not need to do too much to achieve the sound after all. Good. I'm definitely thinking of getting into analog synths and drum machines. Uh, would love to see you do a studio tour type video one day like Future Music Magazine. Uh, be interesting to see uh, what other gear you have slash use. Thanks as always for a great AMA. Uh, keep them coming. Have a great weekend. So I will be doing a studio tour type thing. There's really not that much beyond kind of what you can see behind me. And actually there's more under the table. And Okay, yeah, there's a bit more. There's boxes of stuff there. Um, yeah, so for those of you that are new to this channel, this is the temporary studio that I'm in at the moment. It's the back room of the house uh, because I moved house, oh God, last year now. <laughs> so it's not that temporary, uh, but I am looking to build a studio in the garden. Uh, well, hopefully this summer is really what I'm thinking. Realistically, it should be this summer. Uh, yeah, it's all just money, money, money. Uh, so yeah, so once I've done that, then I will absolutely be doing, I mean, you'll be getting more of a studio tour than you've ever bargained for because I'm hopefully going to try and document the build of the studio and talk about the different materials I'm using and why I'm using them. Uh, but I will say right now, I'm looking at probably getting an off the shelf, uh, garden office type building, um, in fact, I'm thinking, because you can get pre-insulated garden offices for, say, seven, eight, nine, ten grand. Uh, 
however you can get what they call a garden shed for almost half the price and I'm kind of thinking well if I'm gonna be doing acoustic insulation anyway then it might be worth going down that road um, I'm still kind of waiting for the right dimensions and everything to show up um, either way it's gonna cost a fortune because obviously uh, what you don't know is my gardens are on a slope as well so the whole thing's got to be leveled uh, which is gonna be great fun um, yeah, so it does mean I'm, I'm going to be going through a proper studio tour and obviously, I, you know, you guys will be able to watch me cry as I uh, struggle to build it. Uh, I think that's all you asked. Yeah, so I will be doing that. Cool. Uh, can't read your name. W exclamation mark or K exclamation mark K. Uh, is it Wurst Kick? Who knows? Hi Dom, is there a chance that in the future you'll be recording something like Behind the Project? I mean your own productions, tracks, included your releases in my, on Mousetrap, uh, your techniques, tips and everything you do when making tracks. Cheers from Poland. Uh, hello to Poland. Yes, kind of. So I have done, I did it, so the best place to go is uh, sonicacademy.com. Uh, I tend to do my uh, full in-depth tutorial sessions for them uh, mostly because they have the right audience for that and also they're a great company and a great team of guys that work there so big shout out to Sonic Academy and I kind of figured that most of my fans and followers are also subscribers to Sonic Academy so it just kind of helps everyone get a bit more exposure and a bit more in-depth and you know what you're getting then um so yeah i have done a few for sonic academy if you haven't seen those head there now they're still there uh it's a subscription site i don't think it costs much i think it's like is it a tenner a month something like that i don't it's not much anyway um but it's well worth it because you've got thousands of hours of proper in-depth tutorials there so i recommend it to anyone whether i was on there or not um other than that, I, I'm kind of planning on doing another one at some point. Um, I have done a new EP, so I'll probably be aiming to do one of the tracks off that. However, there's a bit of a brick wall on that. Um, in fact, the long-term followers of this channel will probably laugh at this. Uh, I've always banged on about the fact that I develop a sound on say my Moog and then I record it in once I'm happy with it and then I tend to delete the preset and move on and do the rest of the track uh, which means if I want to then change something at a later date um, you know I have to recreate that patch there is uh, one of the uh, the tracks called Stoic um, the lead line of that is about six different synths and several of those are the Moog and because I've bounced them into an audio file, they've merged. And there's a couple of bits that I wanted to tweak recently. And I sort of looked at them and tried recreating it. And I can't, I can't recreate it. I don't know how I did it. Uh, so I'm having a bit of trouble with that. Um, however, I think it's one of those things that 99.9% .9 of the public wouldn't even notice. And it's, it's just a tweak I want to do. But uh, yeah, annoyingly. Uh, Live by the sword, die by the sword. That's what I say. Uh, so Sunset Age Six has replied. Yeah, I'd like to see you making off too. So yeah, maybe I'll do that for YouTube. I know um, Mousetrap are fully behind that. So um, yeah, maybe I'll I'll try and do a couple next time. I'll do one for Sonic Academy. Um, that's why Sonic Academy this time round I did a mix down, which is technically maybe out today uh, because I didn't want to go through another production and then kind of touch on the same techniques so I kind of feel like I have to do something a bit new but I suppose if I'm retouching similar techniques then it's probably all right for YouTube so yeah I'll think about it is what I'm saying uh Deadly Custard Tesla high five hey Dom stoic talk of the devil uh when are you releasing it we want to hear the whole thing um right well yeah I just touched on I, I'm struggling to recreate a bit of it at the moment to try and tweak um 
I'm also waiting for Mousetrap to listen to it. I don't know if they have yet. Uh, it's part of an EP I did. So there are a couple of others that go along with that track. Uh, so your guess is as good as mine at the moment. I'm hoping it'll be out in the next few months or so, but I, I, I mean, it, you know, it, a lot of that depends on Mousetrap hearing it. And if Mousetrap don't hear it in time, then maybe I'll go elsewhere. Who knows? Um, so yeah, watch this space is all I can say, really. Maybe I'll put out a longer clip somewhere at some point. Who knows? Uh, what I don't want to do, and this is a kind of an issue I think most producers have, is especially when you're releasing on well-established labels like Mousetrap, I don't want to be putting out, you know, three-minute clips or whatever, which is essentially the main crux of the track uh, on SoundCloud or whatever, and then it doesn't get released for six months because, you know, people get bored of it. They've heard it, you know, the, the, the people who get excited about my music, and there aren't that many of them, um, they'll have heard it enough times by the time it comes out and I, I don't want to be taking away from the buzz of a new release really so I'm always a bit careful you'll notice if you look at my SoundCloud at the moment I've put in a, a another teaser clip of a rework I've done uh, for Underworld Res um, I'm talking to publishers about potentially getting the option to release that uh, so I've put out a, a little I think it's like 45 second long teaser clip uh, that doesn't really tell you too much more than the, one of the basic breakdowns and the reason for that is because I don't want people to get bored of the track and go yeah I've heard that hundred times by the time it comes out um, you know it's uh, it's a tricky situation you kind of want to show people your music but at the same time you don't want to interfere with any potential record label promotions or whatever because some labels want to throw some money at marketing and they want to you know make a huge get some buzz around a track or whatever and you know if you've already stuck out the track on soundcloud six months previous then the majority of your listeners and potentially buyers or fans or whatever you want to call them you know they've already heard it a hundred times by then so uh, i think you have to be kind of careful with that uh so yeah i don't know if i gave you a high five but here's a high five now uh, andrew hollis hi dom tesla high five uh great videos as always two questions this week one leading on from the mono questions a couple of weeks ago uh not sure if this is part of a bitwig update but i have seen a mono base preset in the midside tool yeah i think pretty sure that's been around for a while uh is this a freebie alternative to the mono maker by bx uh yes basically i mean it does the same thing i i mean looking at brainworks plugins they put some pretty insane features into things um i know they i'm fairly sure they do a mono maker plugin on its own and if they do i, I haven't really seen it I may be just aware of it, um, as you can tell by the way I'm talking about it. Um, but one thing I will say is Brainworks have a habit of putting in insanely cool features that you never knew you needed into their plugins. So if they do a mono maker, then chances are there's probably a load of cool stuff in there on top of just making a frequency mono. Uh, however, obviously, you know, the Bitwig built-in mono maker, I'll call it a mono maker, is exactly what it does on the tin. So there may be differences, but essentially, you know, the fundamental science is the same. So if you're, if you're looking for a cheap or free alternative to something like the mono maker, then yeah, absolutely. The Bitwig uh, mid-side tool has a bunch of different presets and uh, there'll be a base mono in there. I'm guessing you can open that up and change the frequency cutoff point of that as well so yeah yeah you can so yeah so by all means go with that uh two do you offer music production sessions in person where people can visit the studio and have a day or number of sessions just going through things they want to improve on if not would you consider it uh so yes and no yes i have done that with a few people before 
uh, usually they are friends of friends or something like that. Um, and I'm more than happy to because I, I actually really enjoy that. Um, however, what I will say is it, it's not something I offer directly as like a, a service on my website. And the reason for that is because I think it's kind of a complicated issue to approach and I don't believe in scamming people or just making money for nothing. So I would rather people come to me, you know, and if you're interested, by the way, in having something like a personal production service, then um, message me, you know, send me an email from the caneaudio.com website and basically just tell me how long you've been producing uh, maybe give me a couple of clips, you know, some SoundCloud links of what tracks you've done so far. And more importantly, tell me what you would want to get from that. Because I have had, uh, in fact, going back to last week's question, there was a question about collaborations and whether I enjoy it. This was another thing. I didn't mention this actually at the time, but it's really important about collaborations. When I have done collaborations or tried to do the, there's a couple of artists in particular I'm not going to name uh, they've gone hey Dom let's do a collaboration and I've gone yeah I'm up for that let's do it this is going back quite a few years and they've said oh I'll come over to your studio we'll sit down and we'll thrash it out and I've gone well let's maybe sketch up an idea of a track first or whatever uh, that hasn't happened they've come over to my studio We've sat there drinking coffee and we've chatted and had a great day and we've really not done any music and nothing's kind of, you know, you're just not in the right mindset or whatever. So that makes collaborations sometimes quite difficult, especially when they're in the same room. Whereas if you're doing it remotely, weirdly, it's easier. Um, so similarly, what I wouldn't want to happen is for one of you guys to get in touch and go, hey, I'll book you for the day and you know and pay my day rate to sit down and we end up just drinking coffee and chatting shit all day and while that's great for me because I'm making money and having a nice day talking um, I don't think you're really getting your money's worth out of me then and I so I would rather you approach me with what you would want to learn um, whether that be you're just wanting to learn how to mix or if you're wanting to learn how to improve your arrangements or how to take advantage of some of the Bitwig tools or how to fill in the gaps in tracks or maybe all the above you know it's uh, it's one of those things but I think you know obviously if you came to me and you wanted to learn how to do a mix down of drum and bass for example then I would turn around and go I'm out because I wouldn't attempt a mix down in drum and bass because they're very, very pernickety about their mix downs. Similarly goes for dubstep. Um, so, whereas if you, but then at the same time, if you sent me a dubstep track that you were kind of struggling with on the mix, then there's a good chance that I'd be able to listen to it and go, oh, actually, it's not the mix down you're struggling with. It's maybe, you know, the integration of bass at certain frequencies or whatever and in which case we can set up a session so like I say it's not a direct service I offer and that's the reason why is because it's hugely complicated and I wouldn't want to scam anyone out of money or whatever so I would rather people approach me and so if you're interested in having essentially one-to-one -one sessions then I'm up for it but you need to know what you want from it in the first place I guess uh, the other thing I would say is while I'm in this temporary studio, there's probably not really any room to have two people comfortably in here. Um, so again, it's going to have to wait till the new studio is built. Uh, so there we go. That was a very long waffle. Uh, next. You had two questions, actually. No, that was the second question. Right. <clears throat> Cake C. Hey, Dom, any tips on how to mix your lead synths into your mix? Uh, I can mix plucks, pads, bass sounds in somewhat, but uh, when it comes to some serum dubstep growl saw type aggressive patches, it doesn't sound like it belongs in the mix. Um, I know I have to put more 
time in and practice, but anything on top of your head that you recommend. White noise, dither, question mark, cheers. Uh, white noise and dither, forget about it for now. That's way further down the line. If, you, if you're struggling to get the aggressive basses into there, then you need to dial it back 10 steps of, from things like white noise and dither. Um, if you're struggling to get them into the mix, I would first of all look at fundamental frequencies. Um, think about what key your track is in. With an aggressive bass line, there's kind of a, a a sweet spot of frequencies and it's different for different patches, remember that. So if, for example, and similarly goes for sine wave bass lines when they're really smooth, you know, you'll know when it's the sweet spot if you play C, D, E, F, and you'll find, you know, on some patches, D has that big resonant boominess that you want. Um, but if you drop down one more note to, to, I forgot what I said, I think I said D. So if you drop down to C, then you might find that suddenly you lose all the energy. The, similarly for the aggressive growls and saw type basses, you'll find there's a kind of sweet spot because, especially with Serum, a lot of them have the sub bass activated and you do kind of need that sub bass in there and what you're listening to. So when I'm saying fundamental frequency, I'm, I'm meaning the lowest frequency and that would be the sub oscillator. And you might find that actually raising it a couple of notes or sometimes lowering a couple of notes just gives it that extra depth. Um, the other thing I'll say with aggressive saw type bass lines, you've got to be careful that you don't flood the low frequencies yourself as well. It's quite easy when, especially when you're on good studio monitor speakers, it's quite easy to get a bit too enthusiastic with that sub boomy bass. Um, whereas actually if you listen to tracks from say 13 um, or Feed Me or Skrillex or any of the, the big names within dubstep where you get that big gnarly growly bass you'll if you actually listen to it from a point of fundamental frequencies there's not that much sub or low end going on it's quite clean down there um, and it's very easy because I think we hear a finished tracks, you know, if we think of something like Skrillex, Bangarang or whatever, we hear it as this huge monstrous track, which it is. And when you're in the early stages of a track and you're designing the bass line, you're expecting it to be this huge monstrous track, but it shouldn't be one yet. You're still in the early stages and you need to remember that it will get monstrous later on because a lot of that comes down to the mix down and the mastering and you know sticking some great big compressors on there early in the production even but before you get to that stage you you actually you need to start off with something that isn't overpowering so you don't want too much low end in there you want a nice little bit of clean sub and then you want that saw to kind of sizzle so maybe some multi band compression in there um to sort of just tighten the low frequencies and then really push the high frequencies as well and depending on the sound you might want to raise or lower the mid frequencies in multiband compression on that bass line and then similarly for your drums do the same again um, and then make sure they're perfectly matched so the kicks and the bass don't interfere with each other and there's plenty of room in in the dynamics so you want sharp transients as you know in your kicks and things like that um, and then you can kind of fill in the gaps with the rest of your synths and your lead lines and things like that. So uh, I know your question sort of talked about lead synths, but interestingly, the the tricky bit is getting the growly bass right first, because once you've got clarity in that, that's when you can bring in your lead line and that's when you've got you've got a space to put that lead line in. So you kind of need to think of the picture of low end to high frequency and you need to fill up all of the the low end in in the low end obviously with your bass lines fill up the very high end with your your hi hats your snares and get everything really sizzly and and um you know and bright and then think about that that gap there is because there is now a gap 
and in the upper part that's where your lead lines need to sit so um, you know in the mid high frequencies and and then it's a case of questioning the levels of everything to make them sit so that one pokes above the other and then it's at that point that's when you can start chucking compressors at it and going right now I'm gonna slam the shit out of this track and really make it horrible um, and then you can you know and, and then you, once you've got the mix then you go to the master and then it really gets slammed so um, yeah hopefully there's a bit to think about there um, as we're doing for time 25 minutes I reckon do another question hopefully uh, Dan C hey Dom thanks for the detailed answer this is now in my top five most informative series on YouTube not even kidding cheers uh, question for the next one how to approach a label and build a relationship with the label manager slash A&R thanks Tesla rocks by the way they sure do high five uh, that's a good question, so I'm going to reset the camera so it doesn't run out mid-sentence. Back in a sec. Okay, uh, what was the question? Uh, how to approach a label and build a relationship with a label manager? I think that's a really important question, actually. Um, and a difficult one to answer. So, I think we live in a world where people expect things instantly. And that's just not the reality of the world we live in. So, you know, I, I have good working relationships with labels like Mousetrap and things, obviously. But you need to understand that before my relationships with Mousetrap, I'd already developed relationships with hundreds of other labels and spent 10 years working my way up to there. Um, don't get me wrong, there are some guys and women on Mousetrap who um, have kind of just happened overnight, they're still young, they're still fresh and everything's worked for them. I can't answer that and I think if I'm totally honest a lot of that comes down to luck of the draw and that's not something you can plan for. You can't, you can't schedule winning the lottery um, and I think if you want a successful career as a musician or producer I think you need to be able to hope for the best and keep going for the lottery but at the same time you need to plan for not winning the lottery um, so I, I guess from you know my example would be um, something like I, I guess um, my relationship with Wartone Records is run by Sonny Wharton, who I now consider one of my best mates, and I've known him for, oh wow, uh, probably 15 years, um, or the best part of. And, you know, that's a great relationship that we built, and we, we built that relationship because we had similar interests and we had a lot in common, and, and it was we were able to discuss things um, honestly and openly whether that be music or not music related stuff and I think that's important to building a relationship so how you get to that stage is almost trial and error because for every relationship I have with labels like Wartone Records there's probably a hundred ruined relationships that I've had with absolute idiot A&R managers who um, I won't say don't know what they're doing because I think they know exactly what they're doing and that's the bit I disagree with. Um, you know, there are lots of A&R managers out there that are just purely based on sell, sell, sell and, uh, or even worse, the image of selling and the image of being successful and they don't care who they destroy along the way. And there's a hell of a lot of A&R managers out there like that and I have zero time for that kind of person so um, I think you know relationships need to develop quite organically um, and I think if you find a record label or an A&R manager who's on your wavelength uh, you know you're gonna find that you have a much healthier working relationship because you're able to be open and honest to each other and you're able you know one of you should always be able to go hang on that's not gonna work why don't we try this um, so I think that's important, but I guess that's kind of important to life and maybe I'm not giving you 
the right advice on how to start that relationship. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, so for example, I'll go back to Sonny Wharton and Wartone Records. I, when I first got talking to him, I didn't know Wartone Records was going to be such a good record label. Um, and I didn't, I, I knew Sonny as a, a good DJ who was on my level and we were sort of not sharing gigs, but we were sort of crossing paths when we were gigging. And, um, you know, we just kind of got talking and things developed and, and, and then Wartone Records was born and everything became good. And I think that's probably more important in a lot of ways. So I guess the best way to develop relationships with A&R managers is to develop relationships with people who become A and R managers, and again, I guess that's not something you could plan for. Um, other than that, I, I guess approaching a label for the first time is always going to be tricky because it, the bigger the label, the more people they've got chasing them, and potentially for all the wrong reasons. Which means they're probably more likely to be a bit shorter and a bit sharper. Um, so I, I guess the best advice I've got really is is try not to punch too high too soon because if for example you're a new producer and you're not entirely sure if your music is really ready for big labels and whatever it would be probably almost detrimental for you to send a demo to someone like Mousetrap or Ministry of Sound or Universal or Sony BMG or whoever um, because you haven't established that story and that background. And I think I think this is really the crux of what I'm trying to say, is that these things take a long time and you need a story to tell and you need a reason to contact a record label. And if your demo isn't up to scratch, you run the risk of really never developing that relationship. Um, so it's a tricky one. And I guess um, that's kind of one of the reasons why for example, I've got the Facebook group that I've set up off the back of this YouTube channel. Um, and if you go onto Facebook and look up Dom Kane producer group, I think it's called, um, you know, have a look at that and some of the guys on there. And I, I love the fact that I can see all you guys spurring each other on and giving each other advice and feedback and tips and tricks and whatever. You know, I, I can see there are relationships developing there where maybe at some point one of you is going to start working for a good record label or or create a, a good record label that starts gathering momentum and that's really where things start falling into place then so approaching a label is a tricky business um i would say like i say if you if you're punching too high you run the risk of just never getting noticed and that can be quite depressing as an artist even if you're right for them it might be too soon or you might not have enough of a, a a backstory that they like or whatever the situation is um so i guess that's kind of a tricky one um but also it's worth mentioning that a a good lower level record label will probably do more for you as an artist than any of the the big record labels um until you reach a certain point where you outgrow or they outgrow or whatever. Uh, so yeah, I feel like I haven't really answered that question very well, but I, I've tried my best. Um, so yeah. Uh, then Zombo. Hi Dom, what are your thoughts on 100 BPM, mid-tempo, aggressive style of music? I really like it and making more of it on Ableton. Um, so... There are some artists that I really appreciate. Um, I guess it's 100 BPM mid-tempo stuff like Koan Sound. Uh, I really, really respect their stuff. They, I like the fact that they infuse a lot of jazz into uh, their music. I assume they're, they're natural musicians and not just producers, um, but also killer producers. So uh, I really like a lot of that. I don't think I could spend a lot of time listening to it. Um, I also find that there's a lot of stuff from a lot of artists in that area uh, that I won't name, but there are lots of artists that I just find is really repetitive and I feel like it 
doesn't really go anywhere um, which I think is okay if you're doing maybe minimal ploddy techno or progressive or whatever because there are little nuances you can focus on and it's a bit more of a relaxed listener vibe um, you know I'm sure my music is very repetitive but I try to put in little subtle things and sprinkles in there and I think if you're doing aggressive 100 BPM stuff it's very difficult to put in those subtle nuances um, so that is my advice to you is is put in some subtle nuances and change it up a bit um, because otherwise in my opinion it kind of gets a bit repetitive um, it's great to listen to one track but I don't think I could do three in a row for example but having said that I'm an old man I'm you know past my prime so uh, for a lot of people out there I can totally understand that they lap it up and uh, it, you know if I was 20 years younger than maybe I would as well so there we go Dead Mouse Inco, great AMA. You should give away those vinyls. So some uh, some of us uh, becomes one of the 10k owners of that vinyl. Tesla, high five. Uh, so this is going back to the vinyl uh, bootleg remix thing that I did. Uh, yeah, interestingly, the ones I have are the first press as well. I think I had about 20 as the first press. So these are the, the test pressings, not even the final release ones so they're even rarer so you, you if you had one you would be one of 20 i think um i thought they were here somewhere i don't even know where they are they're packed up somewhere um i may well dig them out at some point when i get the new studio built maybe i'll uh, look into that um yeah definitely a, a collectible for someone who thinks it's worth collecting um yeah so there we go sunset 86 has replied saying could be a competition prize could well be yeah uh, Reality on X production 920 so 9 minutes 20 agreed with every word uh, I don't know what I was saying then but thank you very much and I think we're getting there Cakesy thanks Dom Rod Marconi Tesla high five Finn Fighter Tesla high five St Nicholas Tesla high five uh, that my friends I think brings us to the end of today's session um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else I need to mention. No, so I'll be back again recording this Friday morning next week, as far as I'm aware. Um, so, yeah, I hope everyone has a good weekend. Uh, if you have made it this far in, let's find a keyword in the recommended videos. What have we got? Do you know what? I haven't used that one before. Dead mouse. Um, <laughs> That's come up as a recommended video. So if you've made it this far into the video, comment the word dead mouse to let me know. Uh, as usual, please do like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that notification panel and you get notified every time I upload a new video. Uh, yeah, have a good weekend. I'll see you next week. Cheers. <laughs>